This week on the Weekly Pinch from Pinch News. This nation was founded on the principle that there are no kings in America. Each, each of us is equal before the law. No one, no one is above the law. Not even the President of the United States. Today's Supreme Court decision on presidential immunity, that fundamentally changed. For all, for all practical purposes, today's decision almost certainly means that there are virtually no limits on what a president can do. Supreme Court rules that Trump has some immunity in the January 6th case. Making sure that we're able to make every single solitary person uh, eligible for what I've been able to do with the, uh, with, with the COVID, excuse me, with um, dealing with everything we have to do with, uh, look, if we finally beat Medicare. Thank you, President. Biden's family urges him to stay in the 2024 presidential race. A U.S. Supreme Court strikes down the Chevron Doctrine. Summer COVID-19 infections are increasing in the U.S. Tennessee State unveils the first ever hockey jersey for an HBCU team. NCAA D1 Council approves big changes for football, basketball, and baseball, including a cannabis ban removal. Redbox's owner files for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection after missing payments and payroll. U Court docs reveal Michael Jackson was over $500 million in debt at time of death. They are attacking our most vulnerable citizens. The Project 2025 plan is not a game. Look it up! So what is Project 2025 and what is it aiming to do? This is a fundamentally new principle. And it's a dangerous precedent. The Supreme Court has ruled that former President Donald Trump is entitled to some immunity from federal prosecution for official actions he took while in office. This landmark decision comes at the height of the election season and also extends the delay in the Washington criminal case against Donald Trump on charges he plotted to overturn his 2020 presidential election loss. This ends any prospects that the former president could be tried before the November election. The Supreme Court's decision was 6-3, with the court's liberals in dissent. Chief Justice John Roberts wrote the opinion for the majority. He divided a president's conduct into three categories official acts that are part of their core constitutional powers and other official acts that are outside their exclusive authority and unofficial acts. Presidents have absolute immunity for the first category, a presumptive immunity for the second, and no immunity for the third. The president enjoys no immunity for his unofficial acts, and not everything the president does is official. The president is not above the law, Roberts wrote, but Congress may not criminalize the president's conduct in carrying out the responsibilities of the executive branch under the Constitution. This decision tosses out a ruling from the Federal Appeals Court in Washington that concluded Trump is not entitled to broad immunity from criminal charges stemming from an alleged scheme to hold onto power after the 2020 election. The justices sent the dispute back to the district court for further proceedings and gave the court guidance about how to move forward. Justice Amy Kenai Barrett expressed frustration with how the court was sending the case back down for more proceedings. I would have framed the underlying legal issues differently, Barrett wrote. She suggested that because Trump's challenge to the indictment had failed, at least some of the case could go forward. She added that she took issue with how the court had ruled that evidence from Trump's official acts should be excluded from the trial, writing that there was no reason to depart from the familiar and time-tested procedure that would allow for such evidence to be included. Justice Sonia Sotomayor issued a lengthy and strongly worded dissent in which she criticized the court for its decision. Sotomayor wrote, today's decision to grant former president's criminal immunity reshapes the institution of the presidency. It makes a mockery of the principle foundational to our constitution and system of government that no man is above the law. With fear for our democracy, I dissent. Sotomayor concluded, the decision was welcomed by Trump, who called it a big win for our constitution and democracy on truth social. President Joe Biden's family huddled together at Camp David over the weekend to urge the octogenarian to stay in the race for the presidency, despite his dreadful performance in the debate last week that has thrown his campaign in turmoil. Sources privy to the discussion say they criticize how his staff prepared him for the debate and considered if top aides should be fired. Biden spent the day sequester with First Lady Jill Biden, his son Hunter Biden, and grandchildren at Camp David. This was a previously scheduled trip to the presidential retreat in Maryland for a photo shoot with Annie Leibovitz for the upcoming Democratic National Convention. The gathering was also an exercise in trying to figure out how to quell Democratic anxiety that has exploded following Thursday's performance. One advisor described the family members as having offered their unequivocal support. Polls since Thursday's debate suggest concerns about Biden's age have increased. 
A CBS News Yagar poll released on Sunday indicated that 72% of registered Democratic voters believe the president does not have the mental and cognitive health to serve as president. Nearly half said he should step aside. But the message from his campaign team and his family is resolutely firm that he remains the party's best hope to defeat Trump. While his family acknowledge how poorly he performed against Donald Trump, they also believe he is capable of doing the job of president for another four years, according to the people who were not authorized to speak publicly about internal discussions. Um, Jill Biden told Vote Magazine in a phone call from Camp David that they will not let those 90 minutes define the four years he's been president. Uh, they will continue fighting, she said, adding that her husband will always do what's best for the country. In a landmark decision on Friday, the Supreme Court significantly curtailed the authority of federal agencies to interpret laws, mandating that courts must rely on their own interpretations of ambiguous statutes. This ruling overturns the 1984 Chevron versus Natural Resources Defense Council decision known as the Chevron Doctrine, which required courts to defer to an agency's interpretation of an ambiguous law if it was deemed reasonable. The ruling delivered in a six. Three decision authored by Chief Justice John Roberts stated that the Chevron Doctrine was fundamentally misguided and inconsistent with the Administrative Procedure Act APA. Ultimately, this decision signals a return to a pre-Chevron approach where courts, rather than agencies, have the primary role in interpreting ambiguous statutes. Justice Alina Kagan, dissenting along with Justices Sonia Sotomayor and Ketan G. Brown Jackson, warned of the decision's potential to disrupt the legal system. She emphasized that agencies possess the technical and scientific expertise necessary to interpret complex regulations, expertise that courts generally lack. The ruling is expected to have wide-ranging implications across various sectors, including environmental regulation and healthcare. It reflects a wider conservative effort to reduce the power of the administrative state, continuing a trend observed in recent Supreme Court decisions. Supporters of the decision like Roman Martinez, who represented one of the fishing companies involved in the case, celebrated the ruling as a victory for the separation of powers and individual liberty. They argue that it restores the judiciary's role in interpreting laws independently of executive agencies. Conversely, critics, including environmental and public interest groups, fear that the ruling will lead to inconsistent interpretations of federal laws and undermine regulatory protections. Kim Mayer from the Southern Environmental Law Center expressed concerns over the potential chaos resulting from individual judges making determinations on technical regulatory issues. COVID-19 infections in the United States have been increasing for several weeks, driven by new variants and contributing to a familiar summer surge. Despite the scaling back of a COVID-19 surveillance since the end of the U.S. public health emergency, available data indicates a consistent upward trend in infections, hospitalizations, and deaths. According to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, infections are likely increasing in at least 38 states. Wastewater surveillance suggests that while viral activity remains relatively low, hospitalizations and deaths are ticking up. COVID-19 levels are particularly high in the West and South, with viral levels comparable to those seen in February. The summer increase in COVID-19 cases has become a seasonal pattern, though experts note the virus remains unpredictable. Dr. Robert Hawkins of the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases highlighted that the virus tends to thrive in warm and moist conditions, which are prevalent in the South and West. Data from Wastewater Scan, a nationwide sewage surveillance network, indicates that this summer's wave began earlier than last year's and has reached similar levels. Dr. Marlene Wolf from Emory University emphasized the importance of understanding both the seasonality of COVID-19 and the impact of emerging variants on these trends. Recent months have seen the JN1 virus variant, which drove the winter surge, being overtaken by newer variants. These so-called flirt variants possess mutations that enhance their transmissibility and ability to evade immune responses. The KP3 and KP2 variants now account for over half of new COVID-19 infections in the U.S., according to CDC data. The FDA has recommended updating vaccines to target these strains, with new vaccines expected between mid-August and late September. The CDC has recommended updated COVID-19 vaccines for everyone aged six months and older for the 2024-25 season. Dr. Marcus Plessio of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials stated that the timing aims to provide maximum protection during typical peak periods for respiratory viruses, despite COVID-19's constant circulation. Flu and RSV levels are currently low in the U.S., 
The CDC has also updated its RSV vaccine recommendations, advising vaccination for those aged 75 and older and high-risk individuals aged 60 to 74. These updates aim to simplify decision-making and improve public health outcomes. Tennessee State University's men's hockey team, which already has a coach and a player, now has a jersey to complete its ensemble. Coach Dante Abercrombie introduced the new home blue jersey for the first hockey team at a historically black college or university HBCU, which will make its debut in the 2025-26 season. The jersey was unveiled on Friday during the 67th annual Tennessee State University National Alumni Association convention held on the Nashville campus. The team's social media showcased the jersey featuring royal blue with red and white stripes across the sleeves and bottom, a large Tigers logo on the front, and a lowercase TSU on each arm. Abercrombie, a 37-year-old native of Washington, D.C., was appointed as TSU's coach in April. He's an alumnus of the Fort DuPont Ice Hockey Club affiliated with the Hockey is for Everyone initiative. His coaching experience includes roles at Stevenson University, an NCAA Division III school near Baltimore, and the Washington Little Capitals. Additionally, he has served as a coaching development associate or guest coach for the San Jose Sharks, Toronto Maple Leafs, and Arizona Coyotes. Xavier Abel, a forward, became the first player to join the TSU hockey program in January, transferring from Drury University in Springfield, Missouri, where he played for the American Collegiate Hockey Association Division II team. With the New Jersey revealed, Abercrombie is now focused on recruiting more players. His efforts include a visit to Toronto on July 2nd for the annual Black Hockey Summit hosted by Hockey Equality, a nonprofit organization chaired by retired NHL forward Anthony Stewart. In a notable shift, the council has voted to remove cannabinoids from the list of banned substances for championships and postseason participation in football. This decision aligns with a focus on student athlete health and well-being moving away from punitive measures for cannabis use. Penalties currently being served for positive cannabinoid tests will be discontinued immediately. The council has also lifted restrictions on official visits for men's and women's basketball and baseball programs. This change removes previous caps on the number of official visits, allowing programs greater flexibility to manage their rosters and support recruiting efforts. This follows an earlier decision allowing prospects to take unlimited official visits to NCAA schools with certain conditions. Basketball programs will now be permitted to have student athletes participate in more than one foreign tour with the same school, although still limited to one tour every four years. Additionally, women's basketball teams can now compete against other Division I programs during these tours, fostering international interest and providing structured competitive opportunities. The council has approved adjustments to the FBS and FCS recruiting calendars to align with changes to the football early signing period and to optimize recruiting windows. Key changes include extending the July debt period, adding December quiet periods, and modifying contact periods to balance recruiting with postseason preparations and coaching activities. Redbox's parent company, Chicken Soup for the Soul Entertainment, has filed for bankruptcy protection following a series of financial challenges. The filing made overnight on Friday comes after a tumultuous month in which the DVD rental company defaulted on loans, faced repossession orders for its cars, and missed peril for employees. The company informed employees late Friday about the filing and the pursuit of a debtor in possession loan, which would provide the necessary working capital to meet peril obligations. However, securing the loan remains uncertain. Employees have been awaiting paychecks since June 21st, and the company has promised to reinstate health insurance that lapsed in May. Chicken Soup for the Soul Entertainment's bankruptcy documents reveal significant debts to various retailers, major Hollywood studios, smaller studios, streaming platforms, and smart TV manufacturers. Notable creditors include Walmart, Walgreens, Universal, Sony Lionsgate, Warner Brothers, the BBC, Vizio, and Plex. Additionally, the company owes money to its landlords and the vendor providing its car fleet. The financial troubles escalated after Chicken Soup acquired Redbox in 2022, taking on $325 million in debt. The company has faced over a dozen lawsuits for unpaid bills recently settling with NBC Universal only to miss the first payment of the agreed upon settlement, leading to a court order for the full $16.7 million balance. The bankruptcy filing indicates a total debt of $970 million. The filing marks a critical juncture for Chicken Soup for the sole entertainment as it seeks to reorganize and stabilize its operations. 
the outcome of securing the debtor in possession loan will be pivotal in determining the company's ability to continue its services and support its employees. Michael Jackson's death on June 25, 2009, at age 50, was a significant event not only because of his status as a global music icon, but also due to the complex financial and legal issues that followed at the time of his death. Jackson was in severe financial distress, reportedly over $500 million in debt. His extravagant lifestyle and spending habits, which included significant outlays on charity, art, furniture, travel, and jewelry, contributed to this massive debt. Jackson was preparing for a major comeback with his. This is a residency at the O2 Arena in London. He had planned an extensive series of concerts aiming to revive his career and resolve his financial troubles. However, despite these efforts, his financial situation remained precarious. Testimonies during the 2013 wrongful death trial revealed that Jackson's debts had been accumulating since the early 1990s, peaking at over $140 million by 1998 and increasing by another $170 million from 2001 to 2009. Following Jackson's death, the financial burden shifted to his estate, which faced significant challenges, including over $40 million owed to concert promoter AEG, estate executors John Branca and John McClain managed to turn things around by renegotiating and restructuring debt arrangements, significantly reducing interest rates, and avoiding the loss of Jackson's assets. Their efforts were successful, with the estate now valued at over $2 billion. In addition to financial issues, the estate has been involved in various legal battles. Notably, the estate faced lawsuits from Wade Robson and James Safechuck, who alleged sexual abuse by Jackson and accuses companies of complicity in the abuse. These cases, highlighted in the HBO documentary, Leaving Neverland, have been contentious with ongoing litigation as of 2023. The executors have also focused on managing Jackson's legacy, including obtaining an interest in EMI, music publishing, and selling it to Sony for a substantial profit. They have also navigated several legal and financial challenges to ensure the state remains a significant entity in the music industry. Jackson's story is a complex blend of unprecedented musical success and significant financial and legal turmoil, demonstrating the challenges of managing immense fame and fortune. On the 15th anniversary of his death, Jackson's oldest son, Prince, took to his Instagram stories to memorialize his father. The upcoming general election in the United States is generating significant attention, particularly with the unveiling of Project 2025, a detailed plan formulated by former President Donald Trump and his allies to reshape the federal government in the event of a Republican victory. Project 2025 is a comprehensive 920-page document created by the Heritage Foundation and supported by over 100 conservative groups. It outlines a vision for a potential next Republican administration, specifically focusing on conservative policy transitions and personnel appointments. The project aims to transform the federal government to better align with far-right ideologies. The document's primary objectives are categorized into four broad fronts, restoring the family, including emphasizing traditional family structures and protecting children, dismantling the administrative state, including reducing federal bureaucracy to enhance self-governance defending national sovereignty, including strengthening borders and national security, securing individual rights, including ensuring the protection of constitutional freedoms. Project 2025 includes specific strategies for various federal agencies, such as the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Defense, and the Small Business Administration. Each sector is given a detailed plan to implement conservative policies and overhaul operations to align with the project's goals. One of the key aspects of the plan is a 180-day playbook for swift action in the initial months of the administration. This playbook includes strategies for replacing federal employees with individuals who align with conservative principles. To execute these plans, Project 2025 proposes a rigorous vetting process for potential appointees to ensure they adhere to the project's vision. The goal is to assemble a dedicated team of conservatives ready to implement the outlined policies from day one. The Heritage Foundation, along with several conservative think tanks and organizations, wholeheartedly supports Project 2025. However, opposers argue that the plan promotes an extremist agenda, undermining democratic principles and potentially leading to authoritarian governance. Notable concerns include restrictions on LGBTQ plus rights, reproductive rights, and the potential erosion of environmental protections. 
Prominent contributors to Project 2025 include former Trump administration officials such as Christopher Miller, former Acting Secretary of Defense Ken Cuccinelli, former Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security, and Peter Navarro, former top trade advisor. The election and the potential implementation of Project 2025 would significantly impact the future direction of U.S. policy and governance. This coupled with an upcoming tight election displays the importance of the upcoming months in determining the nation's future trajectory. That wraps up all of the news from the Weekly Pinch. Tune in next week for more. In the meantime, visit us online at www.pinchnews.com.